floor and you have a good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, it's a great privilege for me to introduce uh, uh, Professor Ben Veringa, who is going to uh, present today's Mary Wrestlehouse lecture. Uh, ben asked me not to give too long an introduction, and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy not to do so because I'm very keen uh, to hear what he has said, he has to say. And so, uh, I, I would like to, to uh, indicate only one thing, and I agree this with Ben, that uh, although both Andre Geim and, and, and Ben did uh, get the Nobel Prize, that Ben is still one bar behind because he never got the Ig Nobel Prize. <laughs> and uh, with that brief introduction, I should like to give the floor to our speaker, and then at the end of the talk, you'll probably have earned uh, another low doubt. Thank you, uh, Professor Frankel, dear Dan. Thanks for the kind words, and there is indeed some challenge for me. You know, I realize that sitting next to Andre, you know, I still have to work hard, you know, to get and do some crazy thing, I think. So let me start thinking that I'm greatly honored. I would like to, to thank His Highness and Professor Cheatham and his whole crew, everything, everybody here to make this possible, and the honor to be the Dressel House lecturer here uh, today. And to, uh, as we are running a little bit late, I think I will start immediately. And I would like to take you a little bit on a journey exploring responsive and sustainable materials. And I'm a synthetic chemist, you know, so we are keen on making things, modifying things, introducing functionality and so. And what I want to do is to tell you a little bit about my journey in this field with some examples and also uh, continue then a little bit at the uh, second part of my talk to talk more about sustainable materials. Now, facing our future, we all know that there are tremendous challenges. And although people start to complain, in particularly about the chemicals and materials and things that we make, and we heard about plastics before, there is tremendous opportunities for the next generations and all of us scientists to make sustainable processes and products, reinventing materials and energy carriers, changing the face of the chemical industries, which are so heavily dependent upon oil and gas, of course, and, for instance, in medicine, going from trial and error, but take advantage of molecular biology, chemistry, physics, etc., to go from trial and error to molecular design. So, there are lots of fundamental questions, but there are tremendous challenges and perspectives for industry and society to do it different than we do it now. So, with that, I would like to start to talk a bit about molecular motion, dynamic systems, and responsive materials, and in particularly around our work on molecular motors. And I often get the question, why do we need a molecular motor? Why do we need a molecular machine? The same question was asked to these guys, the Wright brothers, slightly over 100 years ago, when people were saying, why does mankind need to fly? If God wanted us to fly, he would have given us wings. You all realize nobody would have predicted that we would have an Airbus, or I came even here with the Emirates in an even more beautiful plane to, the, to, to, uh, to, uh, to this place. And without these planes, it would not have been possible. Imagine, you know, we are all fascinated by the flying pigeon. But you cannot carry 400 people at 1,000 kilometers an hour at 10,000 miles across the ocean. It is an absolute highlight of material science, engineering, etc. All the three and a half million parts are completely artificial. And this Airbus is not flying like a pigeon, I tell you. <laughs> so, we should also be very modest. Because a hundred years after the Wright brothers, we cannot build a pigeon. We cannot build a single cell of the pigeon. And even my colleagues have heard some beautiful studies about Cambridge. They cannot build one of the machineries of the cell of the pigeon. There's still a long way to go. But of course, realize we are not limited by the materials and molecules that were used in molecular evolution. Eh? The few amino acids, the handful of molecules that made our bodies. So, it was mentioned, I think, in 1959 by Richard Feynman. There's plenty of room at the bottom. And we all heard about the studies about going smaller and smaller and smaller, top-down approaches. But what about bottom-up approaches, like nature uses it, starting with molecules, small molecules, building bigger molecules. And it, it took 50, 70 years, etc. And I had the privilege to go with these two gentlemen, Jean-Pierre Sauvage and Sir Fraser Stoddard. I got this magic call from Stockholm. And you see here one of these kind of tiny 
machine-like functions that was built by Jean-Pierre Sauvage. So, I'm a chemist, and I'm pretty proud that we can make all these materials, and I will talk a lot about soft materials today. So we make ethylene, 160 million tons a year, and it was mentioned before, the problems with plastics, it bit, uh, brought a lot of benefits to society, we can all agree. But now we also have a serious problem, that we should not simply burn it or throw it away, but we should do something here to recycle it, and I will come to back. Back to that. A very small molecule, eh? two carbons and four hydrogens only, 160 million tons a year, but we make also hugely complex molecules like vitamin B12, and I would argue this is as important for your body as plastic. Yeah? We need vitamin B12, but we need only tiny amounts to stay healthy, and the whole world production is only 35 tons a year. Hugely complex, very simple. So we can make all these materials. You see here in the left upper corner, you see all the materials that we use today to fight this COVID pandemia. We make soaps, we make bottles, cables and cars, the clothes, all the components of your smartphone. And I tell you, this is really complex and there is a lot of elements and a lot of materials to build a smartphone, you know. So, this is what we are very good at. But what we are not very good at, to make something that moves. This bottle does not move, this does not move, unless I move it, yeah? Your chair does not move. But look at biology, look in your body, the rotary motors, the bio nanomotors, the transport things on the filaments in your cells, the ribosome, an absolutely flabbergasting robotic system that builds yeah, the large part of the proteins in your body. The bacteria flagella motor, isn't it beautiful? It goes in your guts and it swims and it goes backwards and forwards. The optical switching process in the eye. Light comes to your eye, you switch, and you have an information storage and retrieval system. But there is something very special. Realize when you have an artificial robot in a car manufacturing plant, two meters in size, there's a difference of length scale. The robot in your body that makes the proteins, the ribosome, is only 24 nanometers. But realize this is the hard world and that is the soft world. And it's a different world because we are in the world of the low Reynolds numbers and Brownian motion rules. So it's not so much about how to get motion, but how to control motion, because there's motion everywhere. So we started many years ago with this idea, can you take the switching process in your eye and build information storage systems or computation chemistry? And so this is the retinal molecule, we all know that. It's a band molecule, it switches with light to a more linear molecule. And that is the zero one switch in your eye. And there are millions of these switches, of course, when light comes to your eye, the fact that you can see me and I can see you is due that we switch in the eye, it goes a signal to the brain. Important, it should be reversible, eh? Otherwise it's not a switch, we all know that. And but you cannot use easily this molecule, the retinol, to build an artificial information storage material, whatever, or a computing device, because it's way too sensitive outside the protein environment, the opsin. So what we did is we built artificial molecules here, like these so-called overcrowded alkenes. They are extremely robust. They can switch under the influence, in this case, 365 or 435 nanometer, and you could switch back and forth, back and forth between these. So we use them over the years to make optical memory systems, switchable protein channels, so you can incorporate them in protein channels, yeah, in the membrane and switch it open and close. You can make responsive surfaces, and now we have a big program, including some startup companies, of smart pharmaceuticals. I will not talk about that today, but when you have a switch, you can switch on and off biological activity. Yeah? And that means that you can make now pharmaceuticals for instance, anti-cancer drugs, that you don't get all the nasty side effects, but you switch on and off exactly on the spot where it's needed. So, so together with modern imaging techniques yeah, and switchable drugs, you can do high-precision therapy, and this will happen. There are many groups around the world now. This is an emerging field of bioactive materials, and people are working on that, and you will see a lot of that in the future. So let me focus on molecular motors, and we all know what a motor is. Yeah? In your car, yeah? in your body, yeah, the fact that I can move, I mentioned before that I can lift my arm, that I can speak, that I can see you, that I can walk. It's all due to these motors in your body, these billions of motors. And they push the system out of equilibrium. Remember, this is an important challenge for our scientific society, to make things out of working out of equilibrium. Systems, complex systems out of equilibrium. People, I hear sometimes on the TV or in magazines, be in equilibrium. Please don't. 
be in harmony. But when your body is in equilibrium, ladies and gentlemen, you are dead. <laughs> so these machines push it out of equilibrium. This is probably, you are all proud of your car probably, yeah? And the motor in the car, but this is by far the most beautiful motor in this world. This is the ATPA's rotary motor, and it spins, as you can see, things go out, things go in. It's a proton pump, but it is also making the fuel in your body. And I didn't realize that until I discussed with my friends in biology that it makes these billions of motors in your body make almost half your body weight of fuel every day. Can you imagine? You are 80 kilograms and it produces 40 kilograms every day. You don't eat that. The food here is gorgeous, but we don't eat 40 kilograms. No, it's recycling. So what about the question recycling, which is a big issue, of course, in society these days? Our body does it constantly. It recycles half your body of body weight, you know, every day. So, but what is crucial here is, of course, the rotary motion at the nano scale. So what are the key fundamental questions? How to control rotary motion in the nano world and how to control left and right? That is the key problem. If you don't have control over left and right, think of your car, there's equal probability going backward and forward, you don't get anywhere. And if you don't fuel it, it doesn't go anywhere either. So, we took advantage of chirality, and I've been working my whole career on chirality, and we know the DNA is maybe the most beautiful example of chirality, the right-handed chirality, and it's often called the signature of life. And so it was called by nature the Mona Lisa of modern science, and I think we can argue about that, but I agree with this. It's absolutely gorgeous. And so what we did is we took single molecules that we have either the right-handed form or the left-handed form, and we could make them photochemically rotating under the influence of light. And what you see here, spinning, is the world's smallest molecular motor, as far as I know. So we designed this now over 20 years ago, uh, 25 years ago. And you see here in the center, you see it spinning, eh? and it has four different colors. I will explain in a second. It rotates in a unidirectional sense. We can make it rotating clockwise, you can make it rotating counterclockwise. You might argue, oh, I learned in school when you have a carbon-carbon double bond, this axle here, that is impossible. How can it rotate? But of course, it's exactly the same as in your eye. When you have a double bond in the retinal, you hit with light, you excite it, one and a half picoseconds, it rotates. Yeah, That's the photochemical isomerization process. So the energy comes from the light, yeah, and it rotates due to the fact that it is struck by light. It's energized by light. That's the fuel. It's a power stroke motor. Why do we call it a motor? Because it has controlled motion. It consumes energy from the light. It has directional movement, and it's a repetitive process. Otherwise, it would be a switch, eh? back and forth. So, you might. So here is the process in a little bit more detail. It's powered by light. It has two chiral elements a so-called stereo center and a helical structure, and that makes it that you can push it in one direction, either clockwise or counterclockwise. And so we do a photochemical double bond isomerization, 1.6 picoseconds. Then we have a slower helix inversion, yeah, the next step. Then we have again a photochemical step and a thermal step. So it's four steps that make it rotating in a unidirectional sense and add up to a 360 degree rotary motion. Four steps. Two photochemical steps, two thermal steps. Now you might ask me the question, how fast was this motor that you made? Now I tell you, initially, the motor that we made was spinning once an hour. Now that's not much of a motor. You cannot do much with that eh? if you have such a material. But meanwhile, we have made all kinds of designs, I think 50, 60 different types of designs of motors over the years that my students built. And so working on the photochemical step, you can increase the efficiency. And we have now motors that have over 90% efficiency with respect to the wavelength of light. But more important, we could enhance the speed to over 10 million rotations per second. And everything in between, eh? So minutes, hours, minutes, seconds, milliseconds, yeah? All the way over 10 million rotations. We have probably much faster ones, but we have no means to, to prove it absolutely that they go in a unidirectional sense. So we can enhance the speed. And you might ask, how can you enhance the speed then? Now, the slow step 
is the thermal isomerization and the, ring, the, the helix inversion. That's the slow step. And of course, by changing the steric parameters, the electronic parameters, the conjugation, the pi conjugation in the system, etc., you can tune the properties of these materials. And this is typically what synthetic chemists do. They build molecules with electronic donor substituents, electronic acceptors, etc. We build even metal complexes, you know, to tune via the metal. In that way, we can tune the properties very nicely. Now, we can also connect different rotors together, and this is what we did, published recently in Science, where we have this kind of machine type function where you have coupled motion. And my students looked at the moon, yeah, and you might ask yourself, are these students in Groningen so romantic? Now, maybe they are, but the reason is the moon has something special. When you look at the moon, you know you have the synchronized motion, and eh? you see always the same face. So this is what you see here in this coupled motion. This is powered by light, but this rotor part, the dangling rotor, is always keeping the same face to what we call the stator part. And this is just a small stepping stone to more complex mechanical functions, where mechanics are coupled to each other. But I want to take you a little bit through a journey of how we use it at the molecular level, at the mesoscopic level, the macromolecular level, and also at the single molecule level, the nanoscale. Yeah, so at different length scales and time scales. And so let me start with rotary and translational motion. Because once you have such a motor, it's nice, yeah, but how are you going to employ it and what can you do with it? So we, we were inspired by this engineer students that always go to Australia. You remember in, in, in December, uh, sorry, in August, they have this 3,000 3 3, kilometer or so across the, old, uh, the desert, they have this solar-powered cars. That's absolutely gorgeous. And, I say, and we, we got some grant, and we were discussing with the students, and they said, can, can we, can we go also go to Australia? You know, I said, look, we are not engineers, we are molecular engineers. So they decided that we are going to build a nanocar powered by light or by electricity. And we, you see the dimensions, yeah, it's one billion times smaller. You see it moving here. This is the real motion, you know with scanning probe microscopy. This is, we built a four-wheel drive. So the Fiat 4 motors are the four wheels, yeah? But of course, it was not because of this. What we wanted to do is to see if we could make rotary motion into translational motion at the nanoscale. And you see it works. So realize that in the, this is the model of the car. So realize at the nanoscale, also in your body, you know, it is not the motion that you see in the macro world of your car. This is how it moves, a stepping motion. This is how the proteins walk over the filaments in your muscles or in the cells on the actin filaments. But you see, this is how we designed it. And uh, yeah, we all uh, look forward to the modern electric car and probably in the future, hopefully, if there's enough lithium, we will all have these electric cars. This is our nano car, yeah? This white powder, it's really pure, I tell you, you know? And you see, this is a billion times a billion identical nanocars. So with all respect to Volkswagen or, or Toyota, our car manufacturing plant is not so bad after all. Eh? But they are really small, and they move. You might wonder, you know, was there a Formula One? I know that last autumn there was a Formula One race here close by. Eh? Abu Dhabi, yes. So there was also a nanocar race, you know, in Toulouse in 2017, the first one ever, you know. James Stewart and Leonard Grill from Austria, they had a design where they won. Uh, see, 36 hour nano car race. So, maybe a little bit more useful function because this was a very fundamental proof of translational motion. Can we control some, say, properties of a material? And we all know what, uh, what the display material is, the liquid crystal material, and eh, this mesoscopic material. And when you take these rod like molecules, they are normally organized like like beams in a river. And when you have your laptop or your smartphone, you know that depending upon the helical organization, you get different color pixels, and you can change the helical organization. That's typically what you do electri electrically, yeah? That's how you, how you operate the display. So we thought when we put the motor in there, it's a tiny amount, 1%, because it's guidal and it changes its helicity, can we change this helical organization in a completely dynamic way? And yes, it works beautiful. You see, in a minute or so, we can make every color pixel that we want, simply by irradiating with the proper wavelength of light. And it's fully reversible. But you can even go further, and you see here a surface, a thin micrometer film of this liquid crystal material. 
So this is simply the stuff that you also use in your, in your laptop. And you see we put a glass rod swimming on top of it. And due to the fact that this motor rotates and changes the whole organization, the whole surface becomes dynamic. Yeah? You see here the surface architecture, you see the change in color, and this glass rod, which is 10,000 times the size of these motors, rotates, and we can rotate it clockwise, and we can rotate it counterclockwise. This is no tricking, eh? This is a real time, under the microscope, what my students did. So they take a thin film of the soft material, and they can rotate an object, and they have a dynamic responsive surface of these soft materials, completely cloned by switching on the light. Yes, sir. No. Sorry. Yeah. 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 What What the question is? Can you change the correlative yeah. from left to right, and can you go in the opposite direction? Yeah. Now, normally, what we do is we take the opposite enantiomer, so the mirror image form of the motor, and then we can spin in the opposite direction. But meanwhile, what my students did, because I ta I challenged them and I said, look, look, guys. This is not what you do with your car. When you are in a car park and you want to go back, you don't replace the motor, eh? To go no, back. So we made a design, I have no time to discuss this, where we inverted the stereochemistry at the stereo center, and then upon the irradiation we could go in the opposite direction. Yes. So not it is the you gave. not right? in the example you gave. This example works, and here we do it okay. with with the different molecules. With the with the opposite yeah, okay, the mirror image form of the molecule, but it works. But let me go back once just to uh, show you how it works. If this works. Okay. So you see, you have this, this winding and unwinding of the mesoscopic phase, you know? And that is reflected then in the surface tension, the Marigoni effect, and you see a change in the surface. And we have now this responsive surface. And now you can dream about all kinds of applications, but suddenly you have surfaces that are responsive and can adapt and whatever. So. We also put them now recently into polymer liquid crystal materials. So you can take, and I don't want to go into the details, but you can take liquid crystal material that you can polymerize, and they are used a lot these days as, as coatings and so. And so depending upon the alignment yeah, and how much motor, we have a tiny amount of this motor in there, the direction of perpendicular or parallel alignment, we can have bending motions, we can have walking motions, and we can have left and right handed twisting motions. So here you see the, the details. So we can have a bending motion, we can have a walking. So we have now a piece of plastic that walks over a, a surface, just when you switch on the lamp. And we can have, of course, right handed twisting and left handed twisting motions. And you can imagine these kind of polymers now are really attractive to make soft robotics and so robot arms and these kind of things. So that is where we're working on. So 2D and 3D confinement. People, people talked about 2D confinement a lot this morning and about 3D confinement with MOFs and so. But let's start with 2D confinement. For quite some time, we have been working on this design to make motors on surfaces. And this took us 10 years. I can tell you it was not easy. We teamed up with the physics community because if you have a monolayer of molecules, you want to be sure that your molecules are there, but you also want to be sure if they rotate, and ro do they rotate in a single direction, and these kind of things. So we had to, to and no interference and with the surface. That's also important. So photogamically rotating on a surface by self-assembled monolays. And so coming from the Netherlands, you will appreciate that we were interested in building a windmill park. So we built a nano windmill park. So this is what our ancestors did 500 years ago. And we might use them again, you know, when the sea level rises, you know. But here, this is our, now it's powered by light, by the way, eh? not by wind. So they are two nanometer in size. They are self-assembled on gold as a monolayer, and they spin all in the same direction. Now you might say, why do these guys do that? Just to attract tourists? No, because they don't see our, our nano windmills because they are too small, of course. We see them by special techniques like STM and so. But you can use them to control surface wettability, surface thickness, etc. So here is an example where we put some fluor groups there to make it more hydrophobic. We can spin it around. You have a continuous moving surface, and it changes hydrophobicity, etc., and wettability in this way. And then, yeah, what you dream of, of course, now is to make this kind of things that can self-clean and self-repair. And several groups around the world are working on this, including ourselves, yeah? where you take 
responsive surface and certainly you have materials where the surface is responsive and maybe our motors are too expensive but once you know the principles how to do that we have new generations now which we can easily easily modify on surfaces that you have glass that cleans itself you don't have to wash it anymore solar panels i mean in holland we don't have a problem with solar panels because there's hardly any sun sun like here there's a lot of rain they clean themselves but here when you are in the desert i'm sure there's a lot of sun but you have also a lot of dust and so your car in the future, yeah, we will we will have coatings on cars that clean themselves and also healing, eh? Scratch, yeah, because if you have something that's mobile, yeah, you can accrue monomers and they will heal themselves. And people have shown already that with this dynamic surface you can do these things. This is still far from commercialization, but we will have it in 20, 30 years from now, I'm sure. Now you can also go to 3D structures. We will hear more about MOFs. Uh, in uh, in uh, in subsequent lectures, you know, uh, I think Bettina will talk about that. So we will hear uh, we will uh, working together with several people, you know, on metal organic frameworks, and they have become so popular nowadays in material science, thanks to Omayagi and all, and Fujita and all these people. So making layers and pillars, and we thought, can we make these three dimensional, well confined structures where we have the layers, yeah which are not active, but the pillars are motors, and if there is sufficient space, will they then rotate? And indeed, we could make these crystalline materials and we could demonstrate that indeed the rotation still works. So we have millions of these now organized in a three-dimensional porous material, and we can control porosity because they are dynamic and absorption, and we use them now for making active membranes, etc. We also went a step further and make the layers, in this case porphyrins, and you're probably all aware about the porphyrins, you know, they are extremely good light sensing antennas. And so the layers are now antennas to pick up the light of a longer wavelength, say visible light, transmit it to the motors, and the motors start to spin, and then you can change your porosity, etc. So we went also on to make covalent aromatic frameworks. They are extremely robust, not metal, metal based systems. And they are extremely robust, and we can make these porous materials now. They can stand up to 300 degrees Celsius without any problem, and you can change porosity. And together with our friends in Italy, and also in Germany, you know, and Simon Krause, I have to mention his name because he was very important for this uh, work, we make these porous materials that can act as, a, as membranes and responsive catalysts because they are all dynamic, yeah? And they respond to light, and we can tune it, and we can tune absorptivity, responsivity, uh, etc., and we ultimately dream of building molecular factories. Now, in this story, before I go to the sustainable part, I want to briefly uh, talk about cooperativity and actuation in water, because that's another big issue, eh? going with materials into water to make them biocompatible. And we all know what a muscle is. And you see here typical muscle movements, and in a muscle, as I mentioned before, these motors and these filaments, you know, they move with respect to each other. Eh? So the motors walk, and the filaments, you know, they, they glide to with respect to each other. Millions of them work in concert. And so the question is, can we amplify collective motion from the nano to micro scale dimensions in water? So what we did is we built amphiphilic motors. Yeah, you will recognize in this molecule that are carboxylic acid groups. They are, of course, hydrophilic, and you have long tails that are hydrophobic. It's just like a detergent, but now with this motor function inside it. And yes, they assemble very nicely. They give these supramolecular aggregates, beautiful fibers. But that's not a muscle. And then we took a trick that Mother Nature also uses, simply calcium ions. Because the calcium ions bind to the carboxylates, and they organize the whole thing. And what we see here is a typical well-organized structure, and we can draw a muscle, and you see here a free-hanging muscle that moves under the influence of light. And ladies and gentlemen, what you see moving here is 95% water. Just 5% of the material that is organized in this muscle. There's a lot of water around there. And it can lift a piece of paper. They are not very strong, but they move autonomously. They can do these kind of jobs, and it's all by self-assembly of small molecules. So we amplify from the molecular level all the way, and this is a centimeter long. And meanwhile, we put in iron nanoparticles, so we can also now magnetically move them from one spot to the other. With light, pick something up, like an arm, then move them again and release again. But what we also did recently, and this is very recent because it's just it's about to come out on the web, we put there different head groups 
amp uh, that make the amplifier more compatible with biological system, and in this case, cells. And we use mesoscomic stem cells to control the behavior of stem cells. And you all know that stem cells are really very sensitive to stress and mechanical function in the material, like the extracellular matrix, etc. So we grow these stem cells into these muscle-type structures, and it works. And we are this, at this stage now where we can still actuate, yeah, and we can see distinct differences in the stem cell behavior upon activation. So here is typically what we see. We grow the stem cells. You know, they are, of course, more on the outer layer than inside, but that depends on how you grow them, etc. But we are extremely pleased that they operate properly, and we can still do the photochemical actuation, etc. So here we have a hybrid material where we have cells, real life living cells, and in this case, stem cells that can change in different differentiation behavior incorporated into these muscle structures. So I want to summarize this part. Uh, so we, we start with modern nature. We looked at dynamic functions and thought, can we build in dynamic functions in a simple piece of plastic or in a surface? Yeah, all kinds of things, materials. And I hope with these examples, I showed you that indeed we can make all kinds of materials from soft to hard that suddenly are responsive and dynamic. And that brings a whole new opportunities to material science, to make things that move autonomously, etc. Of course, it's extremely early days, but remember, you know, if once you know the principles and you move forward to the future, we can do a lot of things, in my opinion. But I want to finish today, in the last 10 minutes or so, with a bit about greed, feedstocks, and recycling, etc., because that's another important challenge of material science. And so we all know that we should build more sustainable process, recycling our plastics and have maybe other feedstocks. So what we did is, for instance, we take a thiotic acid. That's a molecule that's in your body. It is a cyclic disulfide and a carboxylic acid with a small carbon chain in between. And this molecule is a remarkable. If you just heat it, yeah, it forms a polymer. And it is this, this dynamic disulfide bonds, so dynamic covalent bonds. And then you can cross-link with all kinds of things, like, for instance, with iron, or you can take advantage of hydrogen bonding or whatever, and you can make all kinds of materials out of it, plastic materials. It's based upon a small molecule that you find in Mother Nature. And you just engineer it by using these simple <laughs> techniques. And so now we can cut this material, yeah? And we just put it together again, and because of these dynamic bonds, you see, after a few minutes, you can stretch it again 50 times, and it doesn't break. It's completely self-healing. So now we have a natural molecule that we can make all kinds of materials, but is also able to self-heal. And this, we got quite a bit of attention when we published our first paper in GX, you know, and it says a few commercial available reagents and little heat are all that's needed to make a polymer material that's easily processed, highly stretchable, self-healing and sticky. Yeah, and the polymer may prove useful in making all kinds of devices, etc. So this is just a proof of principle, taking advantage of modern nature and taking advantage of all kinds of combinations of dynamic covalent and supramolecular interactions. And so for instance, you can control the softness and the toughness of the material and the Young's modulus very easily by taking, for instance, a simple iron carboxylate complex or making iron clusters. And you can see taking advantage of dynamic covalent bonds in the main chain, hydrogen bonding, non-covalent bonds, iron carboxylate complexes, or iron clustering, yeah, what is typically done with these inorganic materials, you can change completely the behavior of these materials and the young modulus. And so you can, and this is really, I'm really excited about that, you can go from elastomers, yeah? And then you can recycle it completely because everything in principle is dynamic. And you can go to classy materials, and then you can recycle to an elastomer anymore, uh, again, and we can go to classy materials. And you see, depending on the ions we use, you get different strengths and different materials. And you see the reproducibility, yeah? in the reprocessing in different ways. So this is for us, and these are also recent results, but we have a, a stepping stone now, how to make recyclable materials in the future. Yeah? And so this is what is a recyclable plastic. You go through this loop, you go from a hard material to a soft material to monomers, and you can do it 
in a completely reversible manner with high yields. So we got a nice uh, write-up in matter, and it was uh, in the context of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. It says, look, traditionally you go from petroleum to these plastic products and then to landfill or burning or whatever, yeah, plastic, but we should to go in different ways and think about this, how to make dual closed loop recycling systems, where you not only get yeah, degrade the product and, and get monomers back, maybe, but maybe also upgrade to get new materials, like for instance, from uh, hard materials to soft materials, or the other way around or so. Eh? That is maybe the future. And so, uh, how to make them more robust? Two small studies to finish. How to make them more robust? What we did is, we thought, let's look at water. We all know when we have ice, it is extremely hard material, you know? It can even sink the Titanic. You can skate on it in Holland. That's what we appreciate a lot, you know? But you also know you can drink it. Here is water in front of me. And it's all to do with the organization. Yeah? And water has all these multiple hydrogen bonding because it's a multiple hydrogen donor and a hydrogen bond acceptor. And so we thought, what about hydrazines? A very simple modification. You take a carboxylic acid, you make a hydrazine. So we used again the thiotic acid and make this. And now, look you get this fantastic water-like multiple hydrogen bond network, yeah? ice-inspired reticular hydrogen bonding. And it's absolutely gorgeous how it forms this multiple pattern in a very organized manner. Two very small molecules. And look, this is what we get. We can make now coatings, yeah? and we can put them at diseases on surfaces. And in contrast to existing polymers, which are not adhering always that bad, that well, sorry, we can go in the tiny cracks and you see then you polymerize, you get much stronger adhesives. And look here, 1.5 by 1 part centimeter glass glued together with this little thin film of this polymer. And we can hold 20 kilograms of weight. And it's all based on hydrogen bonding, just like ice, ladies and gentlemen. Now, my final small study then, if the chairman allows me, and that is green and sustainable, because this conference is about material science, and we all heard uh, uh, before about plastic, etc. I'm focusing a bit more on soft materials here today. What about green building blocks and about sustainability? Because this is a big challenge for all of us, eh? whatever we are working on. So, we all know acrylates. Acrylates are made from petrochemicals, 8 million tons a year, diapers, yeah? The coating on your car, the paints that you use to paint your house, they are used everywhere. Acrylate paints, we all have used them, I think, ourselves. So we thought, is it possible to take biomass and then something that does not interfere with the food chain, but something that is wa waste, eh? cellulose, waste. And so can we make similar properties to a green and scalable synthesis using material that we get from waste, wood? So, this is the traditional way I work for Shell, and the way we made acrylic acid there was to take propene, oxidize it catalytically, yeah, to acrylic acid, acrylates, and then do polymerizations. What we do is we take wood remains, actually, that's literally what we do in the lab, we dehydrate it with catalytic acid, so water comes out, water is the waste. Then we get furfural, yeah, which is one of the base chemicals you can get out in large quantities, you oxidize it with oxygen from the air and just visible light and a catalyst. That works beautiful. We do that in a flow reactor now on multigram scale. Yeah, we make half a kilogram a day now, recently. You get these butenolites, yeah? and these butenolites we polymerize. And you see here, the in, in red, the acrylate function. Yeah? And it polymerizes and it gives excellent polymers, like acrylates. It's a bit slower in the polymerization due to the cyclic structure, but it works really beautiful. And so we start with biomass waste. We go via dehydration, water as waste. We oxidize it with oxygen from the air and sunlight. We get this, uh, and we use al alcohol to, to make the acrylate, in fact, but that's also what you do with acrylic acid. And we make a coating and a paint. And then you might say, look, that's all nice, but can you compete with acrylic acid? Now, not now, yeah, because the industry has developed acrylic acid, you know, and there are big factories, and they produce all this. But this is what we see. We do the polymerization, and you see on plastic we make a coating. We make a coating on glass. You see the nice transparent coating on glass. Yeah? 
And we do this together with Axel Nobel, which is the biggest painting comp paint comp producing company in the world. And they tested it on metals. And it turns out that the coating was as good as the coating that's now on your car. These are, of course, the initial tests. I hope they stand also the subsequent tests. Of course, we patented it. We have several patents now. But you can imagine that we are extremely happy because it works on <coughs> different surfaces. And when you can make this kind of hard coatings, yeah, as extremely resistant, simply from bio waste. I, I think materials, and let me focus on plastic. There was this, this uh, report by the Royal Society of Chemistry. Building a new future for plastic will require extensive collaboration across disciplines, including science, engineering, social science, policy, regulation, and business. And I think this is another message for all of us. We cannot do it in isolation. If we are working on chemistry or physics or material science, we can do one part of the thing, but there is more to it to make an industrial process and also to convince our cons consumers that they should use the acrylates, for instance, of the future or the plastics you know, that we are going to make or the materials that they can benefit from. And so, recently, this early this year, we published a, a perspective on opportunities at the interface of chemistry, materials, and biology, where you, uh, hopefully, I have convinced you that taking advantage of this fundamental science. Yeah? We can make new coatings, self-healing materials, new adhesives, maybe soft robotics in the future will, will be very important. Of course, all these bioconjugates and things that we can interfere with biological systems, recyclable polymers, stimuli responsive materials, etc. Using these different yeah, ways we design materials, we use chemistry, we use the physical principles, etc., the engineering principles, and then I think there is a bright future ahead of us. But I could not have talked about anything, wasn't it for the, all these bright students, you know? And you see here, there are people from 14 different countries in my group, and I'm extremely proud of all these talents, that they are so daring and do this work. And you see there is also a lot of girl power in my group. I want to emphasize that. And the funding agencies, of course, but this is the most important slide. These were the people who made all these dreams coming true and worked hard to make it possible. And I want to finish today and once again saying I'm extremely honored by this Dressel House lectureship yeah, and by being here. Thank you so much. But I want to finish with one of my heroes, Leonardo da Vinci. And this is a message maybe to all of us. In the art of building small, Leonardo da Vinci said already 500 years ago, when nature finishes producing his own species, man begins with the help of nature to create an infinity of species. And for all the young talents in the audience, imagine the unimaginable. I thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ben, for a wonderful lecture. Um, there, there is now time for discussion, uh, and I will first check if there are questions on the on the web because I think that that's uh, the first thing to check. Not yet, uh, but I see several questions. I think Bettina was. Bettina, first. yes, she. Thank you. Thanks, Ben, for a wonderful lecture. Really inspiring. Um, so, so. I'm wondering, when you showed these molecular motors, um, we saw that the layout of these motors was very similar for many of them, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering how general is this principle yeah. of those like monodirectional movement yeah. in these molecular systems? Now, that is a very good question. The question is, you know, how general is this principle and do you need specific types of molecules? Now, I, I had no time to go through this whole motor story. But of course, there are several people in the world working on motors now, and particularly David Lee, you know, who works on this rotaxan-based motors where he gets unidirectional rotation. Although it's a bit difficult, you know, to couple that to a, a, a how do you call it, a, a materials event. Uh, but but Alberto Credi, Fraser Stoddard, of course, with his machines, you know, moving things, etc. Where, uh, um, but but also Henri Dube in Germany, you know, works on on motors a bit more related to our design, and he makes some magnificent uh, new designs. Jan Marie Lane has worked in his early days also on some concepts that later out turned out to be also that he could move uh, 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 modify it into motors. So we have several designs. Yeah, it's not only these molecules, but for materials applications, these are extremely robust. 
and we can easily modify them with different substituents and incorporate them, for instance, in polymers and liquid crystals, put them on surfaces, and that worked out fine. And the, the, the important thing is, you know, they should not compromise. You don't want to compromise the motion, because if you put all kinds of uh, things to it, uh, you put them in a very viscous medium or in, in, in something like a polymer, you might compromise the motion. And in, in this is why we keep to several applications to these designs, because they are robust. But we have several others. I mentioned already metal complexes that function as motors and uh, other photochemical driven systems. We have also chemical driven systems. Your catalytic system, because in your body, most of the, except for your eye, most of the motors are, of course, catalytic, chemical driven, not photochemical. And we have to learn that, and we have several cases, and David Lee as well, and so, but they are slow. Yeah? They are not, not very, very good. We have now motors, now I can give another lecture. <laughs> we have motors that we have put nanotubes. It was mentioned before, eh? carbon nanotubes. We put enzymes or ca synthetic catalysts on nanotubes. And then we use glucose as a fuel in water. And they convert glucose, and we can propel these nanotubes, you know, autonomously. Completely autonomous propulsion. I didn't tell this story. So when you think about submarines, yeah, nano submarines, when you think about Asimov, yeah, the fantastic voyage, my prediction is in 50 years the doctor will inject such a nano submarine in your body, yeah, the surgeon, to go to look for a defect. Because we know now how to make the movement. And when you have something like glucose, there's plenty of glucose in your body to make it moving. Of course, this is all a bit science fiction, but it works. Thank you. Thanks for the okay. question. Um, there are a few questions in the audience, but I quickly want to encourage those who are watching <coughs> online to also ask questions, because I'm sure that Ben would be keen to answer questions sure. for younger scientists online. Absolutely. Um, if there's any questions, let me know. I think that actually you know, yeah. was the first. Uh, Your talk is always very inspiring. Oh. Uh, two uh, questions. One is about temperature effect yeah. and fatigue. Would you uh, share some light? Yeah. Yeah, temperature effect, of course, it depends upon what kind of system you design. What I showed you here today, this is all room temperature. But we have also systems that we have to go a little bit higher in temperature, or we can even, we have also systems where we go a bit lower in temperature, but we really want to make systems that work at room temperature. And in particularly now, we put a lot of effort in the last, say, five years or so, on making them moving with visible or infrared light. So we use also two photon excitation, yeah, and, and, and these kind of things to move them, for instance, with infrared light. And so that makes them also more applicable to biological application, where we focus a lot on currently, um, on the surfaces. And so also, with respect to fatigue, uh, I have to see the first organic molecule or soft material that has not show fatigue after some time. We all know colors, dyes, they bleach in the sun, yeah? Probably here more than in Holland, <laughs> because of the sunshine. But we all know that. But on the other hand, we know that organic molecules can stand for a long time. Think of your display. I mean, it's not damaged if you pr do it properly. I mean, these soft materials, they are fine yeah. after years. So, so, but nature, we should realize, nature in the photochemical system and so, they have also self-protecting ways. Eh? If there's too much energy, it dissipates. We know that from the photosystem. So you always have to think about when you make a photochemical active system, but the same also for a redox active system, that there might be competing pathways, competing redox processes, competing photochemical processes, etc. And of course, sometimes we see that, that they degrade after some time. Yeah? Oh, OK, I, I think that actually my, my question, my to, to ask questions on, on, online has worked. And I have two questions to Stuart. I know that you're next, but I, I just uh, quickly <laughs> okay, try sorry, to, sorry. To, to raise those questions first. Uh, the, 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 the first question is, uh, unfortunately, uh, there's no name, but it, the question is, is it possible to form molecular motors with rotation activated via other stimuli, for instance, uh, chemically induced rotation? Yes, I used ma there is there a possibility to use chemical? You, I mentioned it already, yeah. Bettina asked oh. this. Yeah. Can we make chemical driven system, yes. But we have a fantastic rotary motor, chemically driven by catalysis, eh? But it takes 48 hours to make down turn, mm -hmm. you know? It's, it's a bit slow. But we, can, we are working also on, uh, we made an electromotor. We made an electromotor, but there we had the problem a bit of fatigue after some time, mm -hmm. you know? So yes, this can be done. Okay, then the, the next question uh, online is from Wai Li, Nangai University in China, who says, Dear Ben, thank you for your wonderful talk. You had no time to mention the connection between molecular motors and pharmaceuticals. Can you comment on this briefly? Yeah, now we, we don't use so much the motor in pharmaceuticals, but yeah. the switches, you know, you switch state, eh? 
like in your eye, like I mentioned in the beginning, information storage. So you go from left to right. And what we do is we use these switches in pharmaceuticals, I mentioned it in the beginning, to make smart drugs. And yeah. this whole field now is developing like, it's called photopharmacology. I don't know if you heard. You had certainly heard about optogenetics, yeah, where they express these proteins in your brain and you can control brain function, which looks a bit scary. But there you need genetic modification. Mm -hmm. They do that with rats. Eh? They can move the rat you know, on command from one place to the other. But there you need genetic modification. What we do is we build these switches in drugs, like in an antibiotic or an anti-tumor mm -hmm. compound. Yeah? And then you can control the state and the biological activity. And recently what we did with our Japanese colleagues, we, <laughs> we put a switch, a light switch, into a molecule that binds to the circadian clock protein. And we can now control the circadian rhythm in a cell. We did it not in live human beings, but in simply in cells. And we could reset the clock with a couple of hours by a flash of light. I, I, I don't know where this goes to, you know? It might scare people, but it might be also have, uh, helpful in the, in the end if you have a jet lag or so. Yeah? But this is the kind of things you can do, interfere with biological function like you do with the drug, but now you make a smart drug. And I think there's a lot to be developed there. Okay, Stuart, you, you had a question and then afterwards. Yeah. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, so, oh. uh, so you do fantastic chemistry and you use also light for going out of uh, equilibrium. So do you already thought, you said, partially it's already uh, to think about uh, using different kind of light, like circular polarized light, maybe yeah. to get new degrees of yeah. freedom? This is a very good question. The question is, can you use different lights? That is, means wavelength, intensity, etc. Because that's the beauty of light. Yeah, that's the beauty of light that you can control the energy and you can do it non-invasively. Yeah? That's a really beautiful thing with light, if you have no side effects. And you can do it with high spatial temporal control. That's why optics is so fantastic. Now, your <coughs> question about circular polarized light, yes, we did it. Because you think, why putting in the garality in the motor, why not putting it in the light using circular polarized light, left or right? And we did this experiment, and it was uh, not easy, but we got a preference of 0.06%. Because <laughs> the circular polarized light, of course, is yeah, the effects are usually fairly small because if you calculate it via the Kuhn anisotropy factor, it has to do with the absorption and the difference in absorption between left and right. Now, 0.06%. It was difficult to prove, so we had to amplify this chirality to make it possible that we could unequivocally prove. But yes, it works. But the efficiency, of course, is then extremely low. Yeah? But it works. Okay. <coughs> Question. Yeah, sorry, I had to switch off. My. Go ahead. That's yes, true. Definitely. Okay. Yes. Okay. Th thank you, Ben, for a wonderful talk and congratulations on your on your award. <coughs> uh, you mentioned MOFs and PAFs, and you want clearly maybe I missed it. What is the advantage of having a highly porous material where you immobilize now your motors, and why do you switch from MOFs to PAFs where PAFs have very limited Materials, yes, you have high stability because it's organic, but they're not really crystalline anymore. You don't have periodicity in a sense. Yeah. Then you have MOFs no. that they have a lot of porosity and so on. Uh, so what is, what is yeah. in your mind to yeah. switch to this kind of yeah. scaffolds? So the question is about MOFs and POFs and why to make first these porous materials and what and why you have MOFs or POFs and what is the advantage, et cetera. No, I mean, why did you choose those yeah. materials that have to immobilize sure. your sure. motors in there? Yeah. First, first we, we made MOFs and we make several MOFs, metal organic frameworks, because you know they are nice crystalline three-dimensional structures. We know exactly, you know, the position, the orientation. So you have to design, of course, your molecules precisely, eh? the linkers, yeah, and the distance, because if they come too close, yeah, you might still have a MOF with a very, very s narrow space or whatever, poor, but it will never work because there is no space to make something mobile. So we make this very well designed with the spacers, yeah, and the linkers, etc., so that there is sufficient space. You can model that, and then you can use, uh, you can make, you can change the porosity. And oh, uh, Ben, I know all that. I, yeah. I, I don't know. I'm and one of and the why do we make Why did you use MOFs yeah. where actually you have a scaffold? Then you will have no periodicity anymore. What, what, is the, what do you have in mind to use these motors for? 
Yeah, the, the whole because now idea are, is to have enough porosity that we can change it, yeah? For, se for separation? For, for for no, we, we use that f uh, now. First of all, we wanted to show that it still works in a solid, well-defined, three-dimensional organization. And then what we want to do is to see if we can use this change in porosity for the absorption behavior, the transport, or selection. Eh? So we use that now also for selection because you have a guile Garnel environment and it's motile. So like a shuffle when you yes, shine light and on you can... we see that once you irradiate and you have a dynamics mm. there that you see a different transport. Mm. So you can control in a dynamic way transport to a membrane mm. or the absorptivity and you can put in functionality of course so that you capture molecules and you accelerate etc. And then your question about co uh, the covalent aromatic frameworks, we did that not to make a well-defined three-dimensional structure, but to make a porous material that is very robust, yes. still is dynamic, and still has the pores that we could use maybe on the surface, we put them on surfaces now at 10 films, to make this kind of membranes, yes. So my question is, because those are three-dimensional and then they were closed, to have this shuffle tank, it would have been more uh, for a MOF to use a one-dimensional channel, yeah. that now you can have kind of a control in one direction. That, right. That's what I was waiting to Yeah, know. Yeah, so we, we use a control transport. For instance, if you make them on the surface, you can control the transport, make it responsive and dynamic. Yeah, and that is the main goal, yeah, because otherwise you don't need the dynamic function. And we see that indeed you can control transport and you can tree is control activity. Once again, we have not fully explored this, because, but we see clearly very distinct effects. And we are very happy with that. Um, I, th I think that as there's also no more questions online, well, s s oh, I, I, I have a very quick question. Oh, well, uh, very, very quick. It was related uh, to your question sorry. <laughs> energy source. And so it seems like sorry. photons. I was wondering how many photons do you need for one of these molecular rotations? Yeah. Now, officially, you would need two photons, eh? For, for the, but uh, the, it, it's all depending upon the quantum yield, you know. But it seems like a lot. Okay. But it seems like a lot of energy. Now the energy of the photons, if you have visible light, we all know what the energy is. Yeah, I'm not so unhappy with well, using visible like light. Like but the quantum yield. Of, your billions, billions of motors, let's say. Yeah, but that's photoactive yeah. material. That yeah. Photons. That will be very energy yeah. intensive. I'm just wondering. Yeah, but the, what we, we it all depends if you have a material. It all depends on the quantum yield, you know, because the quantum yield is not one. Eh? The quantum yield of a process can be as low as 0.1% with a material. We all know that. But usually, you know, the quantum yields we have now, the best ones, we have quantum yields up to 90%. We are extremely pleased. We have not published yet. The, the best ones we published is about 20% or so. But we just have now discovered how we can jump it to very high uh, levels via the okay. molecular tuning. But uh, indeed, when you have a bulk material, yeah, you have to put in quite a bit, a bit of energy, but that's the same with, with every dynamic function. Think of your body, I mentioned, you know, how much goes in there, and your car, yeah? I but I but I when you have a tin film, yeah? I just wondered how reversible the energy yeah. could be. In, in uh, no, in sorry, yeah. I, I think that we have to cut the discussion but because there's a ceremonial part to this whole thing. <laughs> oh, Because I'm now sorry. I pass the words to okay, Sir Tony. Okay. What should I do, stand here? Stay, stand, stand here, stand here oh. <laughs> and well, let's thank uh, Ben once again for a brilliant lecture. Thank you, Dan. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, uh. Well, <coughs> Dan, that was a dazzling talk, the Millie Dressel House Memorial Lecture. And so I just wanted to say, I just want to say a few <laughs> words about Millie before presenting the award to you. And this is a view, by the way, of Alhambra. Uh, this is taken uh, from roughly where we are now, looking up the coast, if you go to the top of the building. Oh. So um, Millie passed away in 2017, as I mentioned earlier, and um, she, she had a dazzling career. Uh, she was at Cambridge briefly, the University of Chicago for PhD, and at MIT from 1967 to 2017 <coughs> um, as professor of physics and then an institute professor, which is the highest honor you can get there. And of course, she was a member of the National Academy of Sciences, man, many other academies. She had the National Medal of Science, Cavalry Prize. Um, she was known <laughs> as the Queen of Carbon, and in a way she played a pivotal role in the work that uh, Andre did later to uh, develop graphene. Um, so she was a member of the Scientific Advisory Board from the outset, and this was taken in 2007, um, and she's there with um, with both Ram Rao and Nasser Bustami at the 
official launch of, of Rat Cam. I love that photo. Um, here she is with the invited speakers at our first workshop in 2009. And she always loved to come here. And uh, she was a great fan of this. I should also say that Millie was um, Jewish American. And uh, when I first asked her if she'd come to Russell Heyman, she said, does his highness know that I'm both a woman and a Jew? <laughs> and his highness said, Tony, is she the best? And I said, your highness, she's the best. He said, well, sign her up. And his highness loved Millie. And uh, you can see the enthusiasm in her face. So that's just another one. You can see Samuel Schall, our uh, first director there in the middle. And this is at her Cavalry Prize ceremony. I went to the Cavalry Prize uh, ceremony with her in Oslo in 2012. And this was out just off the beach here. She was at the helm. We, His Highness treated all the invited speakers to a, a special boat trip in, in the bay here back in 2013. Here at the hotel, you recognize and uh, with His Highness. And uh, this is Leora. Uh, Millie's uh, granddaughter, and a group here at the, one of the dinners that we had. And I wanted to get this, this last slide, I think, you know, just shows how, in spite of geopolitical issues and so on, that um, Millie was an <coughs> inspiration not only to us sort of scientists in uh, the US and Europe and so on, <coughs> As you can see from this, uh, she's inspiring a young woman here in uh, IWAM in 2016. So that's the background. That's why we have this special lecture, Dan. And you've just given the most dazzling lecture that if, if Millie was here, she'd, be, she'd have 100 <laughs> questions for you. She all sat in the front row. And so we're very proud that uh, you have agreed to... Uh, deliver the lecture. I'm going to try to open this. I can. There we are. Wow. Yes. Thank you. The, the check is in the mail. Would you <laughs> stand over here? Sure, 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 sure. So, this is the award. Congratulations and thank you so much. Ben. Thank, you so much. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm for the cameras. I'm deeply honored. Oh, and thanks, we are honored to have you thanks, here. Really. Thanks for the hospitality here and the wonderful event. And, and this is a great honor. I, I have met Millie only once in my life at an ACS meeting, I think more than 10 years ago. And uh, she was a remarkable woman and I think a role model for many. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you so much.